I'm Jacinta Bowler. I'm a journalist at Cosmos Magazine, and today I'll be traveling into Western Australia to visit the site of what will one day be one of the most powerful radio telescopes in the entire world. I've got my sunscreen on, I've got my long sleeves, and I'm ready to head out into the middle of nowhere. The Square Kilometre Array Low Telescope, or SKA Low for short, is going to be built at the Inyari Mana Ilgari Bandara, or the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. It's the land of the Wajiri Yamaji, and an Indigenous land use agreement has recently been reached. It's incredibly remote. It's an eight hour drive from Perth or a four hour drive from Geraldton. But it needs to be remote. This entire site is radio quiet. That means that there's no Wi-Fi allowed, uh, no phone signal, and even satellites overhead can cause issues with the telescope. There's not much here now, but by the end of the decade, there'll be 131,000 antennas that'll be able to listen to faint radio signals from the heavens. It's been a 30-year journey to get here. The SKA was first proposed in the 1990s, so it's amazing to be here, ready to start construction on site. It's going to be a real challenge. We're building 131,000 antennas spread across 74 kilometres of the outback here in the Murchison and Western Australia. I'm very much looking forward to all the new science that we will discover, but what I'm most looking forward to is being able to demonstrate that we can deal with the enormous data rates that will come off the telescope and that we can just manage a telescope of this scale because it will be the world's largest of its kind. The team in, in Australia is, is building rapidly. Uh, a year ago there were only five people on board and, and now we have almost 30 in Perth and, and about 10 in Geraldton. Although the SKA Low hasn't been built yet, we're currently at the AAVS, which is a smaller test version of the SKA Low. The Christmas tree-like antennas can detect low frequency radio signals. This top bit of the Christmas tree can detect smaller wavelengths, and the lower ones at the bottom can detect the really large wavelengths. This system means that SKA Low can receive signals anywhere from 50 megahertz to 350 megahertz. So how is SKA low different from other telescopes that use similar technologies? So firstly, SKA low is, is bigger than any radio telescope that we have at the moment and, and bigger by quite, quite a large degree. Its footprint on the ground is going to be very, very large, um, as long as 65 kilometres. And what that allows us to do is that it can see, allows us to see very fine detail on the sky and so that our ability to resolve objects becomes very, very high. It's also 131,000 of these individual dipoles, and each of those is collecting photons of light. And so the more metal we have on the ground, the deeper the science that we can do because we can see uh, very, very weak signals. The other thing about SKA Low is the way that we're going to use the telescope. It's no longer defined by just where we put the, uh, the metal on the ground, but instead how we aggregate those signals together. And with SKA Low in particular, we'll be aggregating the signals together in different ways to give us different fields of view on the sky and really tailor up tailoring things to different science experiments. The SKA Low is already exciting scientists about what they'll be able to find with the new technology. I use uh, radio telescopes to study galaxy evolution, so how galaxies have changed and evolved over the history of the universe, and that helps us to study the signals of galaxies in out to billions and billions of light years away. And if we can see further away, in deeper into space, we can look back in time, and therefore we can see what galaxies were like in the past and compare them to what they look like now, and then see why and how they've changed and revolutionise our understanding of the universe. The SKA is so sensitive that astronomers will be able to peer back billions of years into the past, going back to something called the cosmic dawn. This is where the first stars in the universe are beginning to form. The team aren't specifically looking for aliens, but because of the way these radio telescopes work, if aliens in nearby galaxies are releasing small amounts of radio waves, we might be able to hear them with this. Once we get about halfway through building the telescope, it will be the largest telescope of its kind in the world, and the scientists start to become very interested at that stage. So we certainly don't need to finish it before we're getting science results. And the thing that really strikes me when I go out to site 
is the, the real um, contrast between the technology that we're placing on that ancient earth and the, and, and the ground itself. And what we find after rain is that the plants all grow and everything becomes green and the, uh, they grow up through next to the telescopes and almost absorb the telescope itself. And we can still do our science that way because we're not really worried about plants, but it really just makes you understand that we're sitting on this very ancient land with our technology and we need to treat it with respect, but also that, that it will just go on despite the telescope being there. Here. I should have a microphone on, but I'm so overwhelmed. This place is so red and so wonderful, and it's just crazy. It's so incredible. I can't believe that I'm here. <sighs> I just arrived in one of these planes. It's gonna be too bright. I can tell. I can tell. Anyway, this is so cool. 